Okay, let's start in prayer. Lord be with you. Father, thank you for um, this opportunity that we have again to sit um, and hear your word. I pray um, that we will all, myself included, um, have open minds, open hearts, open ears. Lord, I pray for um, what I will say. I pray that it will be in keeping with your word and be true. And they will use this time to move our hearts and our minds um, closer to your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Okay, so um, Jesus told the two vineyard... Who was here last week, by the way? This, okay. Jesus told the vineyard parables. We just got finished with the vineyard parables. We had three in a row. No more today. We're out of the vineyard. Um, we're doing something else. But he told the last two vineyard parables, the parable of the two sons um, and the parable of the wicked tenants, one right after the other in rapid succession. And he told them in the temple, and he told them to the temple uh, officials, to the, the elders and the chief priests. We don't know precisely where Jesus is or when he's talking uh, and who he's, well, we don't really know even who he's speaking to in today's parable. You'll notice if you have your Bible open, which you all should, you'll notice um, at the bottom of the chapter, uh, the end of the chapter 21, there's kind of a break there. The, fair, uh, the, the elders and the chief priests realize, we're told, that Jesus has been talking about them, um, but they can't arrest him because he is, they know that the people will, will riot, and that's kind of the break then, and you get this parable told. So we're not told if it's still the same audience he's speaking to. Um, it may or may not. Now, notice, though, that we're told that they cannot arrest him or the people will riot. It's important for us to see and to understand that this is not because Jesus is popular. He's not popular. I know that when we think of his early ministry and being um, having crowds follow him everywhere he goes, and even when we think about this last week of his ministry when he comes into Jerusalem and he's greeted by um, the crowds and his triumphal interest, uh, entry, we like to think of him as the uh, popular uh, leader and man of, of the people. However, when Jesus distinguishes himself from the Messiah people expect. When he pauses the healing, feeding, and blessing to call people to turn from themselves to him, people leave. The best example of this is Matthew, or excuse me, John chapter 6. Do you remember that? He had like a crowd of 20,000 people gathered around him. Jesus had this huge mega church crowd right there. And then he starts preaching. And in that sermon, he says, hey, you know what? I'm not going to give you any more bread. I know I can multiply bread and feed everyone here and you'll all be satisfied. And I know I can heal all of your diseases. But guess what? I'm the bread of heaven. And you need to feed on me and eat my flesh and drink my blood. Does anyone know what happened at the end of that sermon? Everyone took off. This has crazy stuff. We're not going to eat your flesh and drink your blood. We're out of here. And he was left then with just 12. He was left with just 12. The crowds, it turns out, are driven by much the same kind of desire that drives the elders and the chief priests. And that desire is for God on our own terms. God on our own terms. They want the Messiah who gives free health care, bread, and military victory. That's who they want. Now, if Jesus knew politics very well, um, or church growth very well, he'd use these expectations. He'd nurse them along. He'd, um, he'd keep the crowds going and then just kind of slowly turn them toward his purpose. Jesus, with the kind of following he had at certain times during his earthly ministry, could have been incredibly powerful. He could have done a lot of good for the world. But one thing you may have noticed if you've followed Jesus for any length of time, and one thing we see in the Gospels, is that Jesus 
never does that. Jesus never caters. He never moves himself or changes himself in a way to meet our expectations. He doesn't do that. He is who he is. In fact, that is technically his name, the great I am. I am who I am. He's God. He's the Lamb of God. He's the bread that fills. He is the water that renews. And so, ultimately, what happens in the Gospels is the crowds also, just like the elders and the priests, turn on him. And that's Jesus' parable today. That's what it's all about. A feast that nobody wants to attend. Nobody wants to come. And not just any feast. Let's look at verse 2 there. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited. Now, how many here saw the royal wedding? Anyone? Come on. Now, you, you, if you're a man, I know you may have seen it. You're, not just, you're embarrassed to raise your hand. But I saw um, the royal wedding. I, I, I normally wake up at 4. That's just how I am. I wake up pretty early. Um, Anne has never seen 4 o'clock in her life, 4 o'clock in the morning in her life. But on the day of the royal wedding, Anne was up. She, was, she had her scones ready. She had her tea ready. She was there at 4 a.m. in front of the TV, um, ready to watch. I was shocked that she was there for that. Um, and then about an hour later, we had other women in my living room there to watch um, uh, the royal wedding between Kate and William um, a few, I guess, last year, I guess it was. I'm not sure exactly when it was. Anyway. But it was, it was a big deal. How many here were invited to that wedding? Anyone? No one? Oh, it's not, not as high class a crowd as I thought. No one here was invited to that wedding. I wasn't invited either. Getting invited to a royal wedding is, socially speaking, a big deal. Right? Very big deal. You're elevated by the invitation alone above whatever social class you're in. You might want to take the invitation and just frame it on your wall so that you could show visitors, look, I've been invited to the royal wedding. I couldn't go, but I was invited. You might want to do that um, because it's such a big, a big deal. Wedding feasts in Jesus' day were also a very big deal. Um, they lasted about seven days. At the end of the, the feast itself, which went on for seven days, you would then have the actual wedding um, the wedding ceremony. Royal or not, weddings were the biggest social events on any calendar. Even the poorest host went to great expense. Feeding any number of guests for seven days is pretty expensive. If you include the, not just the food for dinner, I mean, these things... People would come from a long way away and they would stay, so they would not only have dinner to be provided, but all their meals provided. And the wine, remember Jesus turning the wine, the water into wine at the, at the wedding feast, and um, that poor guy didn't have enough, uh, and so Jesus had to make more for him. Feeding any number of guests for seven days is expensive. The average size of the first century guest list was, was between 20 and 100 people. Can you imagine that? Just, just calculate the numbers out in your head. That's a lot of money. I have four daughters, so I know I'm going to be dishing out some cash when they get married, but there's no way I'm hosting people for seven days for any of them. They're not, it's, not, it's not worth that. Um, well, they are worth that, but I don't have the money for that. Um, royal wedding feasts were astronomically, as compared to common everyday wedding feasts, royal wedding feasts were astronomically larger and more expensive. Only the elite were invited. The guest list was so exclusive and the feast so costly and the food would have been so wonderful that few refused a wedding invitation from a royal host. You just wouldn't do that. Not only that, but ancient Near Eastern monarchs weren't known for taking insults lightly. So if you got an invitation, you said, no, I'm not coming, that wouldn't go over well. So you would want to go if you were invited by an ancient Near East monarch. 
Now, the invitation process in the first century was a little bit different, too. Today, if you get invited to a wedding, you get a card, and in the card, you have a little slip, and there's a little RSVP thing there for you to fill out whether or not you're coming, and that will allow the host to know how much to prepare as far as food goes and seating goes for the reception. In the ancient world, it didn't quite work out like that. What they would do is they would send messengers to you, and they would say, there's going to be a wedding on this day, this particular day. Will you come? If you agree, they say, great. They go back. They tell the, the, the whoever's hosting the thing. And then, maybe about a month or so later, on the day assigned, um, you'll get another messenger coming to you to say, um, now is the time. What you wouldn't have in an ancient invitation is, hey, you need to be there at 3 o'clock, or you need to be there at 2 o'clock, because they didn't have the advantage of modern uh, technology and cooking and delivery and all that kind of stuff, So and catering. So really, if you were preparing a feast for 100 people or 200 people, if it was a royal wedding, um, then it, you couldn't be precise about the time of day. So it, that made it necessary to say, all right, you just hang out, you be ready, on this day, the wedding's going to be, and when it's ready, when it's prepared, when the feast is, is going to happen, we'll be sending our messengers to you to come get you. And the expectation was that if you'd said yes to that original invitation, that you would drop everything when the second notification came telling you that things were prepared and go to the wedding. That was the expectation. Not to do that was a, it's very, very rude. Just like today, if you say you're going to be at a wedding or you say you're going to be somewhere and you don't show up, that's rude. Um, same thing in the first century. Having RSVP'd, the guests were expected to drop everything and come. And that sets up the problem there in verse 3. The guests who've already said, I'll be there, are called. But they would not come, we're told. Let's think then about what Jesus is saying. A royal invitation has been given and accepted, but the ones who accept it have refused to show. An invitation was given to Israel. One day, the prophet said, a savior will come. My servant who will do my will and bring my kingdom, said God through the prophets. When he comes, follow him. Israel accepted this invitation. They'd read it. They'd framed it on their doorposts. They'd wrapped it around their wrists. They'd fastened it to their foreheads. They accepted the invitation. They promised, when Messiah comes, we'll go into his kingdom. Then God sent John the Baptist, who said, all is ready. Repent, be baptized, and come to the feast. And then Jesus said, do you remember this? I am the bridegroom. I'm the bridegroom. Come to my feast. But they would not come. How many here have committed to follow Christ? Raise your hand. You can do that. It's okay. Pretty good. Good number. When you made that decision... You've committed, you've accepted an invitation. You've accepted an invitation. You've said, when my Lord calls, I will go. I'll be there. Being a disciple begins with receiving the invitation to eternal life. But those who sit at the eternal feast are those who actually go when the Lord calls. Let me make this more clear. To profess faith in Jesus 
but subsequently to refuse to put what he says into practice is to RSV for the party, but not show up. Or maybe you're not committed to Christ, but you've told yourself that you are a truth seeker. You're committed to finding truth. Now the truth has found you. The one who created you and sustains you and has ordained every single day of your life until it ends has come. And he's calling you to make good on your RSVP to truth and to surrender yourself and come to his table and to be his servant. Now, if you look at this parable, you might be saying to yourself, now, wait a minute, this parable is about a party. It's about a celebration. And you're here harping on obedience and being a servant and being a disciple. What's your problem? Um, Can't you get into the, the spirit of this thing? Yes. This parable is about a party. This parable is about a celebration. This parable is about being called to joy. But here's the thing that we often forget as believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus' commands are not bonds of slavery. That's how the world sees them. What do you mean I can't do that? What do you mean I shouldn't do this? Jesus' commands are not the bonds of slavery, but they are the pathway to liberation. Sin is slavery. Obedience aligns you with God's will and puts you in a place of rest and peace because that obedience is what you were made to do. If you don't believe me, let me just read something to you from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. This is Paul. We, speaking to believers, are his, God's, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works don't save you. Don't get me wrong. You are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone, but you are saved Two good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God created you. You know that, right? God created you is what Paul's saying. He then knows. He knows how you are designed. He knows what will bring you joy better than you do or I do. His commands, when followed, bring you joy, and they bring Him glory. We often, and I use the we talking about all of us, myself included, we often think that that is a lie. How can I be happy if I stop sleeping with my girlfriend, hypothetically speaking? How can I be happy if I don't drink my way to this bottle? How can I be happy if I give up this job? How can I be happy if my family thinks I'm a Bible thumper because I keep talking about Jesus to them? How can I be happy if I give money to this missionary rather than buy this plasma screen? For the chief priest that Jesus was speaking to, it was, we have built life, career, family, future on the foundation of our authority, on the foundation of being teachers and leaders of Israel, how can we give that up for you? For the people, it was, we are being oppressed by these Gentiles. How can we be happy with a Messiah who won't liberate us? Jesus' answer to all of those questions 
is let go of what you think you need. And you'll have room for me. And you will have joy. Let's look at verse 4. The first servants did not succeed in drawing those who had accepted the invitation. So he sends more. Tell those who are invited, see, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. There can be no wedding feast without cost. This host is a king, which makes the cost infinitely higher. This king in this parable gives oxen and calves over to the slaughter. The king who is telling the parable gives himself. Now, in seminary, some of my classmates couldn't understand, and actually probably that's not the right way of saying it, they could understand, but they didn't, the idea sickened them of the cross, of atonement. A God of love should not be appeased by blood, some of them thought. Others thought cosmic child abuse is what the cross is, is what the atonement is. It's a father killing his son. But in other contexts, this principle of cost and of the cross is clear. Without consequences, there is no justice. Say someone breaks into my house and hurts my children. Actually, to make it more real, I was reading about a story in Connecticut where a a doctor, um, two men broke into his home and they beat him up and then they uh, abused and then murdered his wife and his two girls. Horrible, awful, awful story. They caught the guys, they arrested them, and um, they are under trial um, right now. And the man, the, the father who's still alive, said, with God's help, I'll forgive these guys, but I just, it's hard for me. I'll, if God helps me, I'll be able to. But let's say in this trial, the judge says to these guys, you know what? You're forgiven. Go in peace. What would we have? We would have a loving judge, but we would have no justice. Without legal consequences in our world, murder, rape, theft, reign. Anarchy reigns. Nothing and no one is safe. God is... Not only a God of love, but he is also a God of justice. Every one of us have transgressed his law, and we've transgressed terribly. Our sins wreak havoc on our own souls, on other people, and on the cosmos that God created and he loves. How then can anyone be invited to feast with the king until the cost is paid And justice done. Which makes this image of the wedding feast so poignant. Jesus is the one telling the story. And Jesus knows here, as he's telling it, that he is the fatted calf. And he is the oxen to be slaughtered. His body and his blood, the feast... He's not the unwilling child or victim of child abuse. He's God Almighty who endures punishment in our place so that we can come to his table 
feed on him and live. Which makes verse 5 all the more difficult to comprehend. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Note the unreasoning malice here. I mean, the king's not hurting them. The king's invited them to a party. The king's invited them to a celebration, and a celebration that has cost him everything. He's reserved seats for them. They've promised to come. They only have to go and enjoy. Some don't even bother to respond. They hurry off to their work and to their business. Now, this text has been applied to church attendance, and that's not altogether a bad application. We're told in Hebrews never to neglect the gathering of believers. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And Jesus here provides weekly a feast of word and sacrament. Refusing that feast for something else is to set that thing above the king. That's what you do. But Jesus here is pointing to something deeper. True disciples long to worship. They're eager to hear God's word preached and taught. They don't need the command. Longing for a taste of Christ is the fruit that true disciples just naturally bear. So you should ask yourself, is that part of my, am I, am I there? Do I long for the word? Do I long for the gathering of the saints? Do I long for um, fellowship? Do I long for the sacrament? That should be there. If you don't have that fruit, and this is where I think Jesus is going, something deeper needs to be dealt with. The same thing leads people to ignore the invitation originally to eternal life. The same thing drives those who have accepted the invitation to refuse doing the very things, living in obedience, that make life most joyful. That deeper thing is what has been at the heart or what is at the heart of this parable. We, as the people of God, don't believe God. We don't. We may believe in Him. We don't always believe Him. When the invitation comes to trust him enough to give up something we think we need or someone we think we must have or some shiny object that's captured our attention in order to make space for him, we don't really believe he's calling us to a feast. We don't really believe it or we would do it. We would do it. Every time we sin, it's an act of unbelief. I don't believe you, God. I don't believe that your call to me, your command to me, is better for me than what I think I want. In the parable, some invitees ignore the messengers. Others kill them. Sometimes we're so in love with things, people, positions, and our own ideals that the call to let them go makes us angry. I love this thing so much that I want God to go away so I can have it. A woman here recently committed herself to Christ and then she was baptized. Um, and she was living in a, a, a very difficult situation at the time, and um, she was living with her boyfriend, 
and she told her boyfriend that she could no longer live with him and that she would have to stop sleeping with him because now she was a Christian. And her boyfriend said, okay, well, it's either, it's either me or, or, or your church. It's either me or Jesus, is what he said. Um, and she said, I'm, I'm choosing my boyfriend. And she took off. Haven't talked to her since then. I don't mean to hold her up for... Um, as an object, but you know, we all do that. <laughs> we all do that. We all have moments in our life where Jesus says very, very clearly, put that thing away. Drop that relationship. You don't need that. You need to get rid of that thing so you can have more room for me. And when he says that to me, very often I say, no, thank you, Jesus. I'd rather have this thing. What about you? Now, Jesus may have in mind here the New Testament apostles and preachers and evangelists that he will send out and they will suffer um, as they preach Christ and men and women who invite the world to the feast um, will be cut down for it. That's still happening today. But for those who persistently ignore or rage against the king's invitation and who refuse persistently to heed it and come, who will not repent, ultimately there's only one end. And we see it in verse 7. And verse 8. The king was angry. And he sent his troops. And destroyed those murderers. And burned their city. Then he said to his servants. The wedding feast is ready. But those who are invited are not worthy. See that? Many in Israel, and Jesus knows this as he's telling this parable, many in Israel will reject him or reject Jesus. And many Gentiles outside of Israel will reject him too. They'll reject his apostles. They'll reject his word. They'll reject his feast. For those who do that, there is no sacrifice left. The consequences have already been borne by the one who paid his life to pay for the feast. There's no one left to do. There's nothing left to do that if they reject the invitation. No one to bear the consequences for sin but themselves. And we see that there in verse 7 and 8. And if that's you, that again, and we've had this warning over and over and over again for the last three weeks. If that is you and you hear this invitation today and you reject it, you may not have tomorrow. I don't know. I don't know. So hear it, receive it, and come and follow. What makes one worthy to attend this particular feast? We've been talking a lot about works today, a lot about doing good. Is it being good that makes you worthy to come in? Well, let's look at verses 9 through 10. Go therefore to the main roads, he tells his servants, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now, um, of course, we know Jesus said this himself. No one is really good in the, in the, in the eternal sense, but here he's speaking about a comparison between human beings. There are some of us who are better than others. Um, we all know that, and that's what Jesus is referring to. The invitation, though, is given to all, both good and bad. If the original invitees had come, they would have been worthy. To be worthy of the feast, one simply must accept the invitation and come, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, whatever you are, whatever, wherever you are, all who come will sit 
at the king's table for eternity. Not by their own worthiness, but because Jesus has come to make you worthy. By the merit of his life and of his blood and of his righteousness. And so the call here for everyone who hears it, everyone, and I'm not, again, I'm not just speaking about people who have never received Christ. If you are committed to Jesus Christ, I am speaking directly to you. The call here is that you have been invited to this feast, and so what you must do every day of your life is drop. Leave behind, cut out of your life whatever impedes you from receiving and going to the feast. It's, it is a hard thing. You can only do that if you believe God. If you believe God that he's telling you the truth. That he is where joy is to be found. He is the bread of life. He is the water that fills you up. If you believe that, then dropping these things, it's difficult, but you can do it to have him, the pearl of great price. Drop, leave behind whatever impedes you wherever you are in your faith journey. This morning, take the opportunity, pray, give up those things today in your life that are between you and God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Come to the feast. Any, Jesus promises, anyone who is willing to lose his life, and by that, he doesn't mean just die. Anyone who's willing to lose his life as it is, and follow him, we'll gain it. We'll gain it. Okay, now there is more to this story. If you look down, you'll see one guy doesn't make it. Or he comes, and then he gets kicked out. I thought all were welcome. Why is he kicked out? Well, I'm not going to tell you today. I've already used my allotted time, but I will come right back to this parable next week and we'll see why he has not been allowed to stay in the feast hall. So let's stop now. We'll close in prayer. Remember, if you need to pray with somebody about something in your life that you want to give up or if you want to come to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Savior and Lord, um, there will be people in the back who are um, open and willing to pray for you. So I encourage you to do that. Lord be with you. Uh, Father, I pray, um, I pray for everyone here, wherever we are, whether we're, uh, whether we're in Christ or not, Lord, I pray that you will, um, you will take this time, move in our hearts, every single one of us. I, help us to identify those things in our life that are keeping us from you, that are keeping us from enjoying your fullness and living with you um, in glory as you have called us to do. Father, identify those things. Give us the power, the grace to give them up and to serve you more fully. And I pray especially for those who may never have accepted even the invitation. I pray that they do, Lord. I pray you move in their hearts and bring them to your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Stand together and profess our faith.